Uh, it's very exciting to have you here today. And I think we're covering a topic that doesn't often get covered, which is children's and YA LGBTQ literature. Um, and obviously a topic that's really important right now as it's being debated in schools and, and their parents pulling kids out of school because God forbid they heard the, the LGBT thing, which seems really counterintuitive in this day and age. So we'll talk a bit about that. And first, I would like to introduce you and have you share with us a little bit uh, about your book and read from it, and then we'll have a chat. So we'll start here with Kelly Briggs. And the name of your book is Edwin's First Pet. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, um, what what did you write about? What is Edwin's first pet about? Okay, so it's it's about a little boy that's in a um, same sex family. Um, he it, it's it's not directed straight at the point of I've got two mums. It's more of it's just a normal children's story using something that happens in most children's lives, getting a new pet. So it's that's the focus. But then obviously he's having the discussions where his parents are giving him. Um, saying that you can't do this because you need responsibility, you're not old enough, and pets take a lot of looking after. Um, and the reason I did it this way is because there is not a lot of same sex family books, especially in schools, but also I didn't want to make that the main point. I wanted it just to be a children's story book so a, children can, a child can just sit and read it and be like, oh, that little boy's got two mummies rather than a mummy and a daddy or whatever. So that's the way that I wanted to approach it. Excellent. Fantastic. Do you want to read us a little bit? Yes. And show us. Okay, okay, I'll try to teach her. <laughs> okay, so. One morning, whilst tucking into his favourite breakfast of worms and meat juice, juice, Edwin, Edwin was thinking about the question his mummy Cordelia had asked the night before. Have you thought of what you would like for your birthday yet? Mummy Cordelia asked as she walked into the room. Yes, replied Edwin, I would like a puppy. A puppy, mummy Cordelia replied. Pets are a lot of responsibility, Edwin. They need feeding, walking and a lot of looking after, mummy Cordelia explained. I know, but I really want one, Edwin whined with a mouthful of the worms. I will talk to Mummy Drusilla and see what she says. Mummy Cordelia said, clean up the mess around Edwin's mouth. Edwin got down from the table, put on his cloak, grabbed his bag and headed out of the door for school. All day at school, Edwin could not stop thinking about having his own pet puppy and all of the fun they could have together. Bath times, play times, tricks they could play on his sister Luna, it would be fantastic. The next day, Edwin woke up to be surrounded by both of his mummies and his sister Luna. Happy birthday, Edwin, they all shrieked. Rubbing his eyes, Edwin sat up in his bed. Mummy Drusilla handed him a large present. Smiling from ear to ear, Edwin began opening the gift. A puppy, it's a puppy, Edwin shouted at the top of his lungs. There, inside the box, was a small, swuffy-looking puppy smiling up at him. I will name him Fan, Edwin announced. He took Fan under his arm, raced out of his room, down the stairs and out into the garden. He picked up one of his toys and threw it. <laughs> Fantastic. And Troy, welcome. Thank you. So you've also written picture books. I have, yeah. And you, the name of your first one is the best mummy snails in the whole wide world. Absolutely. Is that right? Yeah. Fantastic. Do you want to tell us about it? Yep, yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm a, a head teacher by trade um, and I write and tell stories with the children all the time. Um, so my first book, The Best Mummy Snails in the Whole Wide World, um, was actually written because uh, a parent had approached me and said that her child had been picked on for having two mums. Um, and we just introduced pet snails into the school at the time. Uh, and everybody loves pets, don't they? So um, we decided, well, I decided to write the story about snails. Um, because it gets around that awkward issue of sex because actually the book is more about relationships. Um, and so uh, I, I did that a couple of years ago. Um, my second book, which is also uh, a mollusk themed uh, book. Uh, so you like mollusks. I love mollusks, yeah. <laughs> so this one is The Most Contented Snail. Um, and this is where the baby snails um, go off to snail school. Um, they meet a friend called Cyril the Slug. Um, and I can read a little bit about Cyril the Slug. Absolutely, wonderful. Uh, so this is, uh, this is at the point where we've introduced um, the two baby snails. And so this is from the second book? This is the second book. Excellent. So here are the two baby snails, um, and uh, this is Frank and Carl. Um, and they go off to, um, to sna snail school, 
time. While they both happily played together, they also welcomed others into their games. One such friend was Cyril the Slug. Cyril was a happy-go-lucky little slug who liked to do well at school. He had a wonderful smile and enjoyed playing with Frank and Carl. But behind that smile lay a niggling feeling. I wonder what the feeling is going to be. <laughs> Whenever Frank and Carl played hide-and-seek, they had their beautiful shells to tuck away into. Whenever they played ball, they could bounce it from one shell to another. Whenever they played shell tag, they slithered after one another, trying to win the game. And all Cyril could do was look on. One day, Cyril, looking downhearted, saw his two friends playing a game with their striking shells. Instead of going to try and join in, he merely sat on the side and looked on. Out of the corner of his eye, Frank spotted Cyril glumly sitting by himself. He went over to ask what was wrong. Without thinking, Cyril sobbed that he wanted a shell. All he'd ever wanted was a shell. He longed to play with the games his friends played and he wished that he was just like them. Frank and Carl pondered for a while. How could they help their friend? Carl, the problem solver, hatched a plan. And the story goes on to explore how they go and help Cyril the Slug feel like he's the most contented snail in the whole wide world. <laughs> Excellent, fantastic, thank you, Troy. And welcome Anne, thank you. Now, Anne, yours isn't particularly YA, but it deals with a lot of issues of youth. Um, so you are joining us from kind of a different perspective, which is fantastic. And your book is Sugar and Snails. Do you Great want to name. tell us about it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it just yeah, runs right along, doesn't it? From yeah. heads to snails yeah. to yeah. snails. Yeah. 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 So this is Sugar and Snails, which is um, a midlife coming of age story about a woman who kept her past identity secret for 30 years. Um, she made a life changing decision at the age of 15, and now, after all this time, she's going to have to make another one. But it's pretty tough because she feels that life won't be worth living if her secret gets out. So it's, it's a novel for adults, although some young people have, have read it, and it, but it looks back, um, it's set in the year 2004, it also looks back to her childhood and to quite painful adolescence in the uh, 60s and 70s. I can read a bit actually to link with the others about um, starting school, what, what she remembers from, from that and the difficulties there. Okay. Back in the 60s, with little traffic to threaten us and enough older ones to keep an eye on the tots, we'd make the street our playground from the moment we'd munched our cornflakes till it was time to brush our teeth for bed. As soon as we could walk unaided, we were absorbed into the local gang, running and jumping, hopping and skipping, laughing and screaming between the chip shop at the top of the street and the dairy at the bottom. Our mothers would put us out the door in the mornings, like they might put out the cat at night, depositing us on the doorstep and directing us towards the rabble within, if need, with, if need be, a tap on the behind. The tarmac would become a race course, cricket pitch or battlefield. Coats became hurdles, goalposts, tanks, the pavement, a chalky art gallery, hopscotch grid, or both. We swarmed from one end of the street to the other, flowing like water from one gate to the next. Apart from the leaders, giants of 10 and 11, who were almost grown ups as far as the little ones were concerned, we had no need to distinguish one child from another when we moved with the herd. Dark or fair, fat or thin, boy or girl, grayed out in a blissful merger of body and soul. It was only at school, assigned a specific seat and expected to stick with it hour after hour, day after day, that the differences between us began to matter. School imposed distinctions, a sham personalisation, designed, it seemed, to cut off other options and keep us in our place. This is your classroom, said a beaming Miss Bamford. But when I thought I might like to sample the classroom down the corridor where my sister's paintings adorned the walls, 
I was hauled back and made to stand in the corner. This is your chair. But when I wanted to sit on a seat that was bathed in light from the high window, I was slapped on both hands with the ruler. This is your coat pin, with a lovely picture of a panda above it. And lovely it was, but so were the sailing boat, the gingerbread man, the scarecrow, and the 30 other images arranged around the cloakroom, each one out of bounds. I could hardly contain my disappointment. So many times I'd stood with my mother, my hands clutching the bars of the rusting gate, gazing across the yard at the slate grey schoolhouse, longing for the day I could take my place inside. Twin stone staircases led to a heavy wooden door, the numbers 1873 embossed above it, as grand as the entrance to a castle. At school I'd learned to read and never have to go without a story. I'd glide up those steps like a fairy tale princess, entering one day by the left side, the next by the right. All my hopes that school would widen my horizons caved in on me. I didn't understand that the letters above the stairs spelt out boys on one side and girls on the other. That my mother would laugh, then plead, then slap me hard on the legs and carry me up like a sack of coal when I tried to go up the wrong one. Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. So, quite different. I get dealing with similar themes, I think, um, with childhood and belonging and the, the difference that kids feel um, and not understanding why. So here's my first very vague question for you. Do you remember the very first book you found that had LGBT people in it? And how did that make you feel? Just to throw gosh, a question at you that gosh, I did not give you before gosh. this. <laughs> first LGBT book that I found um, was actually Antango Makes Three. Okay. And the sad thing is, that's actually a very recent publication. It's only about 10 or 11 years old. Um, and I only discovered that um, through a friend of a friend um, about five years ago now. Wow. Really recent. Yeah, very. So, not much help when you're 10. No. <laughs> In terms of children's books, yeah. um, there, are, there are other adults' books, but um, I think that one stands out because, and it's a brilliant story, um, but such a shame that I'm now 42 yeah. um, and I'd only just discovered that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And did you? I have not, I, I can't, certainly not as a child. Yeah. Um, and I don't. I can't think really as, as an adult because I'm quite a lot older. And that um, I mean, there would be, there would have been books around for it, but I don't know if there would have them. Well, I, well, there, there, was, there, sad, there, yes. there, there was, but they were kind of discreet, weren't they? And not aimed toward kids. No, though. not for kids. Uh, no, not, not, for for kids. kids. No, not for kids. And I think that's where the the new kind of transition is coming in, isn't mm -hmm. it? Where the Well of Loneliness was the first one I read, mm. which is dire <laughs> <laughs> and so sad and, and very much kill your gaze, uh, which we're trying to get away with, you know, get away from now. Um, but children's books or young people, I certainly didn't see. No, I didn't have any. No, I didn't. Again, same as you, as in my adult life, I read my first book. Mm. And that was, that was very recent. Mm. That was in the last eight years. But yeah. children's books, not at all. Which of teenage books, yeah. Which leads to the next question then. Why is it important that we get this done? That we start having more YA fiction, more even younger children's fiction that include LGBT themes? Because they need something to relate to. There's kids and teenagers, obviously, that are gay and they feel, some people are very lucky that where they do have a supporting family, supporting teachers and friends, but some people aren't that lucky and I think it's really sad that they don't have an outlet or they don't have anything to relate to. For a teenager as well, in your head, you're thinking that you're in your room and there's obviously something wrong with you. 
but I think if there was more information there and more things to relate to, they'd be like, well, that explains it, or anything else, especially with young children as well. And I don't even mean children that are necessarily gay themselves or anything like that, but me having children myself, it's, it'd be nice for their friends to have access to books, so when their friends come out for tea, it's not, wow, you've got two mums, it's, okay, cool. It's more acceptable, which is how it should be anyway, I think. And I think building on that, actually, it's about normalising yep. same-sex relationships, mm -hmm. just like you would normalise um, a family that is perhaps of mixed race yep. or a family that is adoptive. Or um, there are many different families out there, and it's actually um, it's our job as educators mm -hmm. to broaden people's horizons um, and make people feel that they are valued and they're respected, regardless of what their background is. Um, it's interesting because uh, two years ago I worked with um, my union, the NHT, um, and Stonewall, and we put together some guidance to support teachers, um, particularly well, school leaders, particularly in terms of supporting LGBT staff. Um, and I think children need role models. Children need to be able to look up to people and think, oh, it's okay to be gay. Um, and um, I think schools are the last bastion of um, the, the staunch, and I think this, this comes particularly from um, the, the Section 28 um, legislation um, many years ago, um, which basically meant that teachers were scared of teaching about same-sex relationships, um, and I think it's only now that we feel a bit more empowered to be able to actually come out and talk about these things with children. And, and obviously, yours, yours looks back on, mm -hmm. on a kind of a tortured youth. Um, how, is, how does that kind of relate to...? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of hoping that it isn't as bad for children these days, but obviously I share anxieties about are we going to go backwards. So this is a kind of, I don't know, maybe like a cautionary tale. <laughs> don't, you know, don't do it so terribly, is it? happen for my character here. But also, I mean, you know, on, on the whole issue of um, what we teach children about all kinds of diversity, I think it's just it's just so important. And my background is in psychology, and I keep um, harping on this little small bit of research, and it, you know, it is a small area, which actually is showing that, that diversity is good for our brains in general, so that the more that we're exposed to it, you know, whatever our sexuality or, or whatever, um, it's good. For, it's good for us. It's healthy, and, and particularly if it's done in, in positive, we've got ways of interacting with people positively. And of course, um, reading does that for at any age, really. You know, so it, so for those of us of my generation who have missed out on it in our youth, but you know, it sounds like. You, you have as well. There's a chance to catch up as well with, with a lot of books that are on all kinds of diverse issues. Yeah, absolutely. And with regard to teaching in the schools, um, what would you like to see happen as far as kind of socializing, normalizing, um, and, and getting the word out? Um, how would you like to see that happen? My goal, I want to get my book into schools because you see, like I said, I've got two, two children myself. They bring books home, um, and the, the, the variation that they've got, they've got mixed race families, like you say, they've got different religious families. They learn about so many different diversities in the world. I don't understand what the problem is with this one. It's, I don't understand it at all. And I think because of what went off with, when you were younger and your generation, I think we've learned that it's not helping anything by having people's views so narrow-minded. Give them their own like their own way and show them that make your own mind up it's fine you're going to be okay and then it's just like i say it's not just aiming at people that are saying oh i think i'm gay or there's something wrong with me it's for people that aren't gay it's to help them help other friends and socialize and things like that as well and i just think it's just it just should be made more normal because there's nothing there's no issue so i think it'd be quite nice for a child to bring home his book oh this week mommy i'm reading this and that's it, it's not a big deal. I don't want everyone to think that it's a massive issue. We haven't got to put a big thing on it, 
just let them do it. And it's, do you know what I mean? I think that it needs to be more open. And you think starting at school age yes. is, is important? Yeah, because that's the bonding time with your parent. You bring a book home, you have reading time, we fill in the reading diary. That is special. So if that child of five, six, seven years old has questions, you can answer them. And then that child is going to grow up a better person because they're, they've already been informed. They haven't got to go into the world where some people don't have that opinion and they've got a negative opinion. They should be strong enough then with the information that they've had for the prior years to stand up and say, well, actually, I don't agree with you. I don't think it's an issue. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, actually. Um, because, um, so my philosophy is, I use a lot of picture books in all of my teaching, um, because actually a picture book is there to be shared. And um, so my books are actually aimed at um, five to nine broadly, six to nine um, years old. Um, but I've actually shared it with children um, as old as 11, 12, actually more as a discussion point, because um, when I've shared these stories in assemblies, and I've gone into a number of different schools now to actually share the story, um, to talk about the, the impact of actually um, relationships, um, it's, the feedback that I've had has been very positive. Um, one boy um, who was in year six, um, I, I basically read the story to the children and I said, um, put your hand up if you can tell me what you think the moral of the story is. Um, and a year six boy put his hand up and um, he basically said, well, that's easy, love is love. And that really blew me away because it was quite profound actually. Um, I use that as my hashtag now when I'm tweeting and doing all sorts of things with, with the, the book. Um, because actually for me, that is the powerful message that we're getting across to the children. And it's actually, um, I think the reason that some um, some groups, and I don't necessarily think it's necessarily a religious group as such, um, because there are a lot of LGBT Muslims out there that actually don't have a problem with it, and there are a lot of other Muslims that are out there that don't have a problem with it as well. Likewise, there are a lot of Christian and Jewish groups who have got a problem with it. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's um, one particular group. Um, I think actually the issue that they've got is that they're seeing the sex side of things as opposed to the religion, okay. uh, the, the, the relationship side of things. And actually, we're not talking about um, the, the, the sex part of stories with the children. Yeah, that'd be awkward. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I mean, that's the whole reason why I chose snails in the first place, because actually they, they lay eggs. So. Um, but um, the, the, the point behind it is you actually want the children to go away and realise that actually there are lots of different relationships in this world, um, just like you can have a brother-sister relationship, you can have an auntie-uncle relationship, um, there are lots of different families and as long as you've got a strong bond with somebody, then you can make that attachment and then you can, you can hopefully grow up in quite a well-rounded way. Um, so it's actually getting that representation across. So, kind of like Kelly's saying, starting it very early, yeah. and getting that just normalization done yeah. because of course your poor character doesn't get that no. and it, it quite quite drastically affects your character by by having that bubble of of non self acceptance it's also i mean it, an issue for parents as well that you know that, that not all parents are actually able to manage parenting very well in fact you know, but I suppose I moving beyond the, the LGBT area um, into just that kind of anything about you know your point about love and that should be starting for these children long before they're they're at school and again that's something that's kind of breaking down in society with, with the lack of investment in preschool care sure start that we have which is just do one of the decent things that Tony Blair's government did. It was breaking down. And, um, so yeah, I mean, just get that message of love and, and modeling how to, how to love as well, because some people don't, you know, don't know how to, to do it and people suffer. And I suppose for this in, in my novel, the parents were quite scared about having this child that they didn't quite, that wouldn't fit in and they wanted to help but weren't quite sure how to and 
the ways that they did it actually messed things up. Oh, they, they kind of muddled through as, as best they, they could, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't so good. Which I think was quite generational in a way oh, as absolutely. well. There's no booklet with parenting, is there? No. <laughs> so, dealing with kids who are different or perceived different can be very difficult. Um, certainly, I, I didn't see any books like that when I was a kid. I had a gay parent, even, and, and in the 70s, that was really unusual. I think it's fabulous that you're able to do these books with your kids now and give them an entirely different experience than, than your character had, than, than I had. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most difficult part about writing youth and, and YA LGBT? Uh, I would say it's actually getting it recognised. Um, it's a hard market to get into full stop. Mm -hmm. um, so I've written to a number of um, different uh, people trying to get my story out there. I've actually self-published in the end uh, because I didn't want to lose the creative control of the, the book um, and actually I didn't want to sit around twiddling my thumbs waiting for somebody to eventually say, oh, yes, I like this story. I believe in the story, so I'm getting it out there. Yes. Um, so uh, if, if there are any publishers out there that want to take it on, great because it's very hard work doing it this way. If you're watching right now. So, <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, I, I appreciate this. It is a very um, challenging market out there. However, um, research does um, state that uh, people are now coming back to the humble book as opposed to using yeah. Kindle um, and other electronic reader um, variations. Um, so hopefully there is, there's a bit of hope out there. And you're actually going... <clears throat> You're currently going to schools, aren't you? I do, yeah. And so, um, running a project. So I, I work in a school, um, <coughs> and I'm in, in school full time. However, what I do during my school holidays, because um, the the county that I work in <coughs> is, has completely different holidays to every other county <coughs> around here, um, and so I tend to go and visit different schools in different counties. Um, and I've done various uh, book signings uh, before. Um, I will lead uh, <coughs> workshops. I, I do assemblies with children, and I share the story. Um, and I think it's important to get out there and do that. But in my own school, um, I've been working um, as part of the part <coughs> of um, the No Outsiders project, um, which was originally started in Birmingham um, by Andrew Moffat. Um, and basically it's a collection of um, 35 different picture books um, that uh, some of them have got LGBT um, links there's I think four <coughs> LGBT um, storylines but the rest of them have got stories of um, normalising disability normalising um, different religions different family makeups um, and so um, and we've introduced that right from um, our reception class up. Um, so every child in the whole school um, takes part in, in these story times and we, we do a, a particular talk, a particular lesson about the books. So in, um, in reception class, so that, that's um, four and five year olds, um, we have, uh, it's just a small hardback picture book called Mommy, uh, Mommy Mama and Me. Um, and it literally just talks about this is my mum and um, this is what I do with my mum, this is my mama, this is what I do with my mama and it just kind of um, introduces that, that, the fact that this, this child has got two mums. Um, I mentioned Antango Mix 3 earlier, that book is, um, is actually used in year five um, and uh, that was actually filmed by the BBC recently. Um, because they wanted to see how we actually used the picture books in our school. Um, and that is basically the story of, um, the, it's a true story about the gay penguins in New York Zoo. Okay. Um, and uh, the zookeeper basically um, recognised that these penguins um, have got a, a, a relationship that they're, they're wanting to look after an egg. Um, so the zookeeper gives them an egg and they bring up uh, and hatch the egg and they, they bring up a, a baby penguin called Tango, it's very sweet. 
Because everybody likes pets. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and and that's, that, I think, is quite a key thing. If you have something that, that people can relate to, yeah. then you're going to get the buy-in. Yeah. And actually, with, with um, picture books, it's great because you can share. As a parent, you can share. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you're actually educating the parents as well as educating the children. Um, Which kind of goes back to what you were saying, Kelly, about yeah. bringing the book home yeah. Yeah, and parents simply sitting down to read it with their kids and that just being an aspect of the book. I think by doing that as well, the scope for it, how big it could be from that what did change in that one little thing. If you think you've got that book in your house, you, you have reading time with your son or daughter, I don't know, one night you go out, you've got a babysitter, that babysitter's going to sit with that child. What if that babysitter's having problems and they're reading it and think, do you know what? They clearly are acceptable, accepting it, and they think it's fine. Maybe I could talk to them. It, off, it opens so many avenues without you even trying. So a butterfly effect. Yeah, yeah, but in such a positive way. And I think it's. It, I think for the next generation, it's just going to help so much because there's there's so much hate and, and things going off nowadays, and everything's so negative in the world, and there's so much bad things going on. I think we try and educate the children that we've got now. I'm hoping they'll grow up more informed, more accepting. And, Without signing the issue, I think the world would be a nicer place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the world being a nicer place is ever going to be a cliche, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. And do you worry about kind of getting flack for what you do? Um, and you've got, this is your third? If this was your first, but you've got yeah, two, right? Yeah, yeah, I've got a set. Another novel and a short story collection. And are they kind of LGBT as well? No, no. I mean, in, in my second novel, there's, um, it's about a heterosexual relationship, but the woman's best friend is gay, and the man has the usual, well, no, sorry, not the usual, <laughs> <laughs> the prejudices that some men have. But, but I think it's kind of, it, it show, I mean, it, it's about something different. It's about a man who seeks to resolve the relationship problem by keeping a woman captive in a cellar. So it's a kind of, it, that's the story. But there's a, this is kind of side issue. It, it, it's, I think it shows his prejudice is about his emptiness rather than based on, a, on you know any any rationale well, well, kind of a standard homophobia yeah. yeah yeah but it's kind of like it, it you know he's this weird weird character so that that and i'm quite interested as a writer of um putting in what we call ism, what I call ism, so the homophobia and, and all kinds of prejudiced characters to explore that because this is an act, I mean, it's the negative side of what we're talking about, but this is a, an aspect of society as, as well, but about how that, that's dealt with. But I always worry when I do that, it, you know, whether people, that people might think that those are my prejudices, but because there's, you know, there's some bits, of, particularly in my short story collection about racism and, and things like that, that I hope. Tough, tougher up. subjects. Yeah, I like tough subjects. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think the, the LGBT sector has its share of tough subjects to deal with. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Amy Dunn, who couldn't be here today, has written self-harm, and I think you mm. touch on self-harm mm. as well. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, my novel, the, the novel, it starts in a contemporary stream in the 2004, and it actually starts with quite a graphic description of self-harm, which is cutting her arm, which is something that she'd done quite a bit as a, as a child, and then there's a, the crisis that provokes the eventual change and redemption at the end of the novel. Um, her response to that is, is, is self-harm. Again, unfortunate, which is another very, yeah, very common issue. It is, and, and to see it in LGBT fiction for young people, I think is is really important mm -hmm. yeah. um, to touch on those dark subjects that that the kids will have to deal with at some point. That's interesting because the um, the NHT guidance um, that um, I helped write with Stonewall um, looks at a lot of research 
um, that basically states that LGBT um, people are much more um, likely to self-harm um, and much more likely to have depression or um, try and take their own life um, than non-LGBT um, people. And I think it's, that is partially because um, it's been so suppressed um, and so people don't know how to deal with it. And I think touching what you were saying about um, any phobias are uh, based on, uh, on fear, and I think they are. I think a lot of um, any kind of um, homophobia is based on a fear or a non-understanding of the subject. And because somebody is then so frightened of it, they push it away because it's easier to push something away than to start to look into it and start to feel a bit easier about it by finding out more. And books like yours make you look. Um, do you think it'd be too early? What, what age would you say you start kind of introducing me with the slightly darker subjects to kids? I mean, you have two at home that are fairly young. 13 and 11 now. Yeah. So this is kind of the time, isn't it, when they, they can start looking at dark issues? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a really difficult thing because obviously you don't want your child reading about things like that. But also, you need to make sure that there's nothing going on so that then you can help them if there's anything giving them those sort of thoughts. And it, it is from a mum's point of view, it is difficult. And it's, I don't particularly, I wouldn't like my youngest one reading about self harm because I, I, just, I just don't wouldn't want him. Because again, I like, for as long as I possibly can, I want them to think and feel very happy and very safe because once they're out in the world, that's it. And I think, as I've said already, I think the world's full of so much ugliness anyway. And you're a child this much of your life and an adult this much. I just want them to hold on to something beautiful for a little bit longer. But I think now with my eldest, he's 13, he's going to be going through changes, he's going to be hormones and things like that. He needs something that's relatable and he, if he's having problems, he needs to be able to read about it and think, okay, I need to talk to somebody or anything else. So yeah, I think it's important. Do we have any questions from the audience? Not yet, okay. <laughs> do you actually, uh, do, you, do you feel a sort of call as LGBT writers to present like only a, a more positive side of the experience or a negative and do you think you're going to get criticism either way if you're only focusing on the positives you're not showing the negatives and if you're showing the negatives you're not showing the positives? That's a great question. Yeah, I think so. I think the reason that I went down the route of doing mine is because I did some research and I couldn't find in England any um, LGBT books in school for Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2 at all. And my children were bringing books home that were so varied. In fact, one book they bought home, it was from a very, very popular um, book collection that I read when I was at school. Um, and they bought it home, and I loved it as a kid. And they bought this one book home, and it was about terrorism, and it was extremely detailed. And I, I hit the roof. I was like, I don't understand how you can sit and tell kids that this is what's going on when the, I mean, he was, I think he was seven when he bought it home but you can't tell him that he can have two mums, it's just insane. So I think the way that I did mine, I did my research and there wasn't any books in schools, and the only books that I could find, children-wise, were in America, and they were called things like, this is Oliver and he has two dads, or this is Mary and she's got two mums, or whatever, I wanted to- Quite specific. Yeah, I don't want to say, I'm gay, here's my book, <laughs> read about it, it's mint. I want it to be like, here's a children's book, and oh look, he's got two months. It's not about the fact that he's in a same-sex family, it's about the fact he's a child, and then you find out he's got two months. And it's, I don't want it to be that that's the biggest deal. Mm. I just want them to think, because then I think sometimes if you spotlight it, you're adding to the fact that you're making that a big deal. Because it isn't, it, it just needs to be normalised. And it's like, yeah, okay then, your mum's gay, it's fine. Mm. You're not gonna melt. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to keep that positive, that positive message, yes. as far as yeah. keeping the, the dark stuff out for a while. Yeah, in the books that I'm doing, yeah. but I do think that the message just needs to be delivered at different sections, mm. in different age yeah. books as well, I think it does. So, and of um, course as a teacher I'm sure you... Yeah, I, I think um, books need to be age appropriate, mm -hmm. um, and actually um, as a child generally um, everything is all lovely and rosy and you want to, um, you want to keep that childhood 
and special for as long as you possibly can. Um, there are some books that you can use. Uh, we've got one um, basically that talks about having um, a chimp um, and actually you've got a chimp inside and that chimp is, it can be very angry, it can do things that are, uh, are not very nice, it can um, do, uh, I always ban the word nice, um, it, it encourages you to do naughty things and actually it, that is a way of encouraging children to think about um, what, what they've done in terms of potential actions um, in a different way but in a positive way and it's kind of handling it in a positive way um, without it being too in your face um, and I think um, the, there are subtleties that you can use in books to try and get those mes messages across but um, for certainly for primary school children you want to try and make it as positive as possible because you want to you want the children to, to feel positive about life don't you? Yeah. Absolutely. For me, it's quite, it's a bit different because I don't actually identify as LGBT, so I'm not an LGBT author, and therefore I'm, well, or therefore I'm quite anxious about presenting the negative side, as, as there is some, quite a bit of in, in my books, along with, along with positives, because, you know, like, well, what's it to do with me? You know, what, what, what do I know? What am I doing sort of interfering in this, in this area? So it's, it's an area that does cause me some anxiety. And that, so I was very relieved when it was shortlisted for the Polari First Book Prize and that it was um, endorsed by the actor Rebecca Root and a few other people who've been through sort of similar experiences as my character have responded positively to it. But it was, it was quite a risk actually as I look back putting this, this forward. It was a story I wanted to tell. Um, but you know, I did ask myself whether I had a right to tell it. But it and, that, and things have actually changed so much in, in the four years since it was published. So that, so that it was published in 2015. And when I started writing it in 2008, the narratives that, that I saw about this issue, as I'll call it, were, were kind of, they weren't very nuanced as far as I could see, see the ones that, that were it, uh, um, out available to the, the general public. So I wanted to write something which would be a bit more ex exploring you know, not a black and white story, I, I guess. But, um, so that's why I did. I took that risk, and I think it paid off. And I think that kind of brings us back to where we began, was talking about how times have changed, mm -hmm. and and how different times are. I mean, I could have been taken away from my mom when I was little, on the if anybody found out that she was gay, and now you're writing books and taking them to schools, mm -hmm. and I think that that difference is is really quite stunning when you look at it as a generational thing, um, that we've taken some massive leaps forward in that way. So, talking about that in the scheme of things, what would you like to see be the next stage? Lots of these books or not needing them? What would you think would be the next stage in, in children's and YA? Hmm. Um, I think actually, the next stage will be to see it as, I'd like to see every school with some of these books in. Um, and I, I don't mean hundreds of them, but I, want, I think every school should have a representation, just as every school has now got a representation of books with um, black yep. um, characters in, or um, religious uh, elements. I think every school should have some books in there. That's what I would like to see. That's why I joined the No Outsiders pilot um, in, in Leicestershire in the first place, because I think it's important that we actually have that across every school, because schools are going to get the children that are going to get the adults that are going to then start to breed more acceptance across the whole population. Like Kelly was saying, the butterfly effect. Yeah, definitely. absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, what would agree. you like to see as the next stage? The same, really. Um, I don't think you need. And like the schools I'm for, of 
all of these sorts of books, but I think definitely more than one. So it's not like, <laughs> this is the gay book, your child is <laughs> yeah. I don't think you need that, but I think just the mixture. I mean, there's so many books in schools and they touch on so many different stories. There's, there's so many different collections as well. Like I say, when I was at school, I was reading all the different chip books and things like that. There's so many different stories that it touches upon with all the diversities. Just a few in there, it, I think it'd be nice. Just put them in there. I don't think it needs to be this is the section for that and that's the section for that. They just need to go in, this is a child's story, but that's all it is. Right. And I think it just needs to be available to everybody. And I think that's what would be nice in most of the schools mm. in the UK. And I think that's what we need to do. That's interesting, Gilly, because I think there's been a lot of debate as to whether we still need the LGBT section on a bookshelf <laughs> in, in a bookstore. And of course, many bookstores have done away with them and mixed, yeah. mixed the books in. But the argument is then, but if you want an LGBT book, you no longer know where to look for one because they've been mixed in. Mm -hmm. So, but with kids, obviously kids just want books. Yeah. <laughs> so, how do you balance that then with having kids who, who maybe need these types of books and helping them find them? I don't know, I mean, I think with... With, like, with children's books anyway, I think it should just be all mixed in, but I think with any school library or public library anyway, I think there is a sort of system where you can find, I want a book on this, this and this, it auto populates anyway, so there is a way, if you want to go in and say, I want this book, there is a way to get it, I mean I've been in libraries before, I wanted to have this, this and this, it's not in the section where I'm finding it and the librarian can take you straight through it straight through to it but obviously with older children you're not necessarily going to want to talk to your librarian and say I need a book on, about gay people because that is part of the issue you don't want to Being talk about it yeah. but I think with a lot of schools and universities of kids that age anyway they have their own library system on the computer so they can find it and sort it themselves anyway hmm. I think that probably would help as well anyway with them because they don't want to be shouting about it they just need that information so I think I think there is a system really anyway hmm. but I don't think you need dusty shelf in the back corner yeah. <laughs> saying this is the section for gay people. Right. And there's a lot of organisations out there that actually have um, now found um, various um, LGBT books anyway. So, yeah. I mean, Educate and Celebrate, um, Out in Education, they're just two um, that do have a list. Stonewall have got a list of, of books. Um, they instantly don't have mine on there yet. But and they do need to kind of regularly update because there are a lot of books that, that have come on the market recently. Um, and I think it's good to have that broad range. Um, but actually schools can go and access um, and it, I think schools need to be proactive about doing that. They need to go out there and, and get a collection of different books. But I don't think they should have them segregated in the rainbow corner. Um, <laughs> I think you've got to have them interspersed with all the other books so that yeah. it is normalised and children yeah, will go. You can't normalise it if it's separated, can you? Yeah. So it's defeating yeah. the object. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And, and I mean, that kind of goes to your book, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a ge and I mean, one of the things about my book is, and, and one of the ways that makes it a bit more difficult to sell is that it doesn't actually describe what, why it's an LGBT book. And, um, but that's been part of the mystery, it's, it's read as a mystery, so that this woman has a secret and you know that people read it and find out what that secret was and then it's, oh gosh, yes, well, we, we're on her side now. And then I think of, you know, a lot of people have read it and, and come to sort of like an understanding of issues that they maybe wouldn't have, have thought about. So that's definitely, yeah, it's, it sits in the mainstream. But it also kind of, it misses out, I think, as well on being picked up because it is, so in a way, I don't know if I'm sort of contradicting myself, but I'm almost thinking that does need it to be on the rainbow shelf that, so, that, so that it will be minorities. But yeah, it's difficult. But I mean, when you're saying about the classification, that's a, another thing that has actually has changed in my lifetime. It's that because that because of the internet and that, yeah. with, that there isn't something doesn't just have to be in one category. It can be in multiple categories at the same time, and and it's just so much more easy to pick out on a digital system than it is on concrete shelves. So, yeah, what yeah. a great world. <laughs> <laughs> 
And on that note, we will close. <laughs> what a great world. Thank you very much to our wonderful panelists and your wonderful books. Hold your books up. Yay! Yay! Yay for books. Um, thank you for being here today. And if you're interested in these books, please do have a look and look them up and tell people about them so that we can get these into schools and out into the world where kids can read them. Thank you very much. Thank you.